Social security has been one of the biggest debates facing our nation's politicians and our people because this program will become insolvent within the next 10 years. By 2033, the money well that we're using to pay our elderly or retired citizens and disabled will dry up. So right now, one of the most important conversations as we head into the November election this year is how do we reform social security to either get rid of it altogether make it so it's solvent, or figure out a way to rebuild this program so it works for our current structure. So today, again, as always, we've got Recycle Mike, and we put together a lot of information here that will help us understand this program and the implications that it may have, as well as the policy positions held by the current people running for office. So without further ado, I'd like to start with explaining what Social Security does, some of the history behind it, and what, how it was formed. Um, and I think to do that, what we have is a little video that we'd like to share to start. How is Social Security funded? There are two pots of money that fund Social Security. One pays benefits to retirees and their families. The other pays for disability benefits. Together, they're known as the Social Security Trust Funds. So that's where the Social Security taxes withheld from my paychecks have gone. That's right. The trillions of dollars in the trust funds come mostly from workers' FICA or self-employment taxes, with more collected from income taxes on Social Security benefits. The money also comes from investment returns on government-backed securities created just for the Social Security trust funds. Why do I keep hearing that Social Security is going broke? That's a myth. Social Security isn't going broke. It does need to be updated, though. For years, Social Security collected more in taxes than it paid out in benefits, building up a big reserve. Now that's changing because the retiree population is growing so fast that the system is likely to be paying out more each year than it collects, shrinking the reserve. Even if the reserve runs out, Social Security can still pay benefits from the taxes it collects each year. But the payments would be lower unless Congress acts to shore up the system. To learn more, go to aarp.org slash social security. So, Mike, that's an awesome video put out by the AARP, and I think it makes it very simple to understand. But I have a glaring issue with this video because it directly contradicts what I literally just said one sentence ago, which was that Social Security is going broke. I think all of our government officials agree to this. Why would the AARP tell, a AARP tell us that it's not going broke and that's a myth? So I think they're trying to stress that the program is sustainable in some measure uh, with the taxes that are still flowing in. But what will happen at that anywhere between 2031 to 2034, but the middle ground seems to be about 2033, we're going to run out of that trust fund. And what that's going to result in is an immediate 23% uh, in cuts, uh, I'm sorry, cut to benefits of those uh, recipients of the program. And for many people, that's, you know, not the only lifeline, but a significant portion of their income. So yeah. the AARP is trying to stress that. <laughs> yeah. So I guess what they're explaining is if that trust fund runs out, which is all of the surplus money that's collected year over year, and that young number used to be quite large, but as our demographic right. shift changes, there's less people in the workforce and there's more retirees time over time. In fact, uh, we have a chart to show that. Let's see when, when this all happened, right? It happened around the financial crash of 2008. So as of the demographic shifts and we see the amount of people in the workforce go down, but the amount of retirees go up, this shift has happened in that surplus of money. So as you could see, we had, uh, this is in millions of dollars, so you have almost $200 billion of surplus, but as everybody lost their job, or many people did in 2008, all of a sudden, we've started overspending. And as the years have gone by, our surplus has begin, begun to dwindle. And as recently as 2020 to 2021, that's when we first experienced a deficit. So right now, as that video described, once the coffers run out, for lack of a better word, this is what we're experiencing. So I guess at this time, because we're out of money, where does Social Security benefits even get paid from? So that's the thing is it rely only from the revenues that are coming in from that FICA tax. And actually what happened in 1983, they, uh, there, there was a big change to how uh, it was funded. So that year, they signed an agreement to change the way uh, Social Security is taxed, right? So before it was tax-free, and now it is actually taxable gains. And while that seems onerous at the time, 
that single action was enough to account for the baby boomers and their retirement. But what we've been hit with since the 2007 and 8 housing crisis and then the pandemic is we have a lot of people either retiring early, drawing on disability benefits and things like that, or if they've lost their jobs, they're not paying FICA taxes, right? So that's a ton of missed revenue during those time periods. So, uh, you know, the key is always trying to figure out those metrics. So I would actually attribute a lot of it not only to just the economic impacts, but wealth inequality that's kind of growing. So let me, let me put on my little liberal hat here. Yeah. Um, so when this program was originally designed, it was intended to capture a certain percentage of wages. And that percentage of wages now does not account for how much wealth has kind of accrued towards the top, right? Mm -hmm. So when they were shooting for that 90 to 93% of wages, there wasn't uh, you know the top 7% of income having as much wealth as it did. So the idea between you know the Biden plan and some of the more liberal plans would be to increase or raise this cap in some way because we are uh, we have a lot of income that's uncaptured. Obviously, the counter position would be that once you reach that cap anyway, you're capped on receiving what Social Security benefits uh, you, you will receive in retirement. So you know the argument would be why am I paying more for less? But like mm. I said, the original design of the program was to capture a certain amount of wages based on that wealth distribution and those things have changes. Now we kind of have to have an honest conversation with ourselves is, you know, do we want this program to be part of our values and our budget? And, uh, you know, that's where we have to navigate. Yeah. So, so to put that into maybe a little bit simpler terms, if you're an hourly wage worker at McDonald's or Starbucks, then you're effectively not reaching that income cap per year, which means you are expected to pay your six or 7% social security tax rate as is your employer for all of your earnings throughout the year. Whereas someone who makes, let's say 300 or $500,000 per year, they're only taxed on that amount up to the cap. So if that's, and it is 160,000 or some odd this year, then more than half of their income remains untaxed on the social security. So as you kind of described, right, people that don't have a child, they don't collect the child tax credit, um, but why, so, so people that don't have to pay the full amount or people that earn out of Social Security. In fact, these people probably aren't even dependent on Social Security later in their right, lives right. if they're such high earners. So they're going to be now under at least the Biden plan or suggestion to pay more into this tax. And really, that's right. a Robin Hood approach, taking from the wealthy and giving it to the, the have-nots. And I think that that's one solution. Um, but there are many others. So you actually touched on in 1983 how there was reform, but there was another key reform in that uh, decade, and that's because in the 70s it was another hard time for Social Security where they hit a deficit. So they right. came to an agreement on major reform. And the other major thing that changed was the retirement age. They clocked it up from 65 to receive your full benefits to 67. And I believe there's even talks now where it's going to 70, or is it 70 right now to receive your full benefits in 2024? So it's 67, and then there are uh, late retirement benefits to 70. So if you continue working and you put off Social Security until 70, I think it's 8% per year, if I remember correctly, you get uh, as an additional bonus to your potential benefits. So okay. that's certainly one component of it. It, it is a very small component, because like I said, uh, of where we can recover funding to help uh, improve the solvency, but it's certainly something that's on the table. Um, I don't want to give Ben Shapiro too much credit, nah, but but there is something to be said that when you do retire, right, like you you lose purpose in life. So if if there's a means to keep working, and 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 the Social Security Administration as well as the AARP, they all stress that if you can put off retirement by even just a couple of years, it significantly improves your outcomes and and your financial resilience. Yeah. I mean, hey, I see like my parents or other people's parents or my grandparents the way they grew up. And I think that a lot of people look forward to retirement and that they get to slow down and, you know, focus on their boat or their home projects that they haven't been able to right. uh, or their family. Right. Um, get out of that office that they've been in for 40, 50 years. Sure. Um, so as Ben suggested, right, if as, exactly what he says is Social Security was not designed to provide retirement benefits for over 20 years to folks. And that has to do with the life expectancy. So back at that time in the 70s and 80s, medicine was not as advanced and the life expectancy was much lower. So now as it's higher, right, that goes back to that changing demographic shift. So collecting less money and putting out more money. So not only is it Ben Shapiro suggesting this, but that's also Nikki Haley's main campaign promise. And 
I, I haven't followed her after. I think she dropped out. Uh, maybe not. I'm not even sure. But she, in yeah, fact, she dropped out, but not really. <laughs> so she wants the exact same thing. And she's all over the board. She's got a long history in politics. So she's made a lot of comments in the past. But one of her comments right. here is that Social Security goes bankrupt in 10 years. I think we can all agree to that. Medicare goes bankrupt in eight. Anyone that says they're not going to take on entitlement reform means they're going to go in and be president and leave the country bankrupt. You can't do that. Right. So we got an election in 24 this year, and the president's going to take over, whomever it may be, if it's Joe Biden, he'll continue, in 25. That means that if it goes for four years or eight years, the president following that will 100% run into this issue. It's not a question. It's a matter of fact. So. This right. is the time within this new presidency here to figure out what we're going to do. Um, so we touched a little bit on Biden's plan. We touched a little bit on Nikki Haley's plan. I should say we touched on Ben Shapiro's plan. Maybe we should touch exactly on what <laughs> Biden's plan is. Um, sure. So it looks like what he just came out with, and actually he came out with this on March 11th, so just under two weeks ago, what he details is that he is not going to touch or cut Social Security. So it's interesting to see that Trump and Biden fully agree entitlement must remain because much of the country and a lot of their constituencies on both sides rely on that. Right. Um, so right. no benefit cuts. But how he does that, as you described earlier, is increasing the tax rate on individuals and specifically the wealthy. So let me ask you this, because he's going to do that by increasing the earnings cap. How do mm -hmm. you balance his promise of not increasing taxes for anybody that earns less than 400000 Yet he's promising to increase the Social Security payment tax to the cap above 160000 So that's a pretty wide range, right? If you then go from making 160000 on the nose to 250000 all of a sudden you're paying 6% more on that money than you would have. Your taxes have gone up. So I believe that there's a little bit of disingenuity here, um, but perhaps you can help me understand what he's kind of getting at and how he makes that make sense in his own head. So the problem with Biden is, unfortunately, is he's promised this, this uh, you know, either an increased tax or raising the tax cap uh, around these $400,000 income earners on several different plans. So he's allocated the spending a few different times. But the idea is that there's this growing wealth inequality in the country. And if we can fix, and it's only one of those solutions, right? There's many, as we'll get into later, there's many different ways we can attack this. But one of them would be to just simply address how much of the wages are captured within taxes, uh, specifically in our, our example, the FICA tax. Just simply raising taxes on the highest earners is exactly what liberals and left of center people want to hear, right? It's a great dog whistle to get them to turn out to vote. Um, but there is real economic impacts to those things, right? Um, Either they're going to figure out other ways to reduce their effective tax rate. You know, there's other loopholes within the tax system and things like that. Or it might be part of these companies that we want to come here and, you know, build these sustainable technologies or semiconductor technologies or any of the industries that support them, right? So we have to think about that because part of the deficit equation that we're facing with the overall budget is not just how much we could cut spending, but we also really need to figure out how we can get income to come into the government. And that doesn't necessarily have to be always from raising effective tax rates, but just figuring out ways to get more taxes in by growing the size of our companies, our workforce, and things like that. And, yeah, growing our GDP. Interesting. Yeah, because that would exactly. naturally increase the amount of taxes. Uh, I suppose by that token, though, if you're taking in more workers and more businesses, you have eventually more entitlements to pay out, but potentially not if it's remote work or outsourced work. We want to fix that equation, right? And that's what we'll try to get into. There's, there's many different ways to skin this cat. It's a, just a matter of political will. Um, if if you've ever thought, you know, why can't we fix Social Security, or you've heard about the report since, you know, 2006, 2010, 2015, and now a 2023 report, you know, they've been talking about this for 20 something years, you know, right? So actually, if I could pull up a Ben Bernanke quote, because I think it just summarizes it too perfectly, he said this in 2006. From a broader economic perspective, the question is how the burden of an aging population is to be shared between our generation and the generations that will follow us. A failure on our part to prepare for demographic change will have substantial adverse effects on the economic welfare of our children and grandchildren on the long-run productive potential of the U.S. economy. He said this in 2006. We've been talking about this in 2006. Many partisan and bipartisan you know, think tanks have come out with solutions and stuff like that. The reason why it hasn't been fixed is because they don't want to. And, and we really need to hold our, our politicians to the fire because 
every time we always have you know solutions that can fix it but they just become increasingly more expensive they require a higher FICA tax if we wanted to fix you know the equation of how much income is coming in uh, we want we need to address more loopholes each and every time if we want to make the budget balance out and make Social Security solvent again so we're really paying for inaction and almost any wrong action is still cheaper than <laughs> no action at all at this point yeah well you you see the numbers kind of trending in that direction where all of a sudden we're we're heading towards doom. It's like a train track or a train crash. You right. can't look away. Um, but it is, like we said before, this is a bipartisan issue. There's no question that it needs to be solved. Um, and I want to touch on, or I want you to touch on more specifically, uh, some of how, how important these entitlement programs are. Because you do hear a lot of people on the right, and I'm going to push back on those folks that say, we need to do away with Social Security altogether, right? That's that lift yourself up by your bootstraps mentality. And I subscribe to that in a right. lot of ways. Um, but this really does help a lot of people, uh, is specifically disabled or those that are widowed or widowers, so not able to really support their families in a way that they had expected to or the way that anyone else might be able to. So um, walk us through some of these charts here and understand how important these entitlement programs are. So the first chart we have here is the U.S. Social Security benefits, and to kind of demonstrate how they're modest in comparison to other country spendings within the OECD framework. Um, the U.S. is on the lower end of that totem pole and how much uh, we tax and how many benefits are laid out to our uh, recipients. Um, if we go through those numbers, actually, I know you did a little bit of background research on them. Some of those countries have uh, substantial income tax rates, and, and then sometimes it's a very high tax rate in addition to a Social Security tax on it, and it could be anywhere between 45 to 55 percent of your income is going towards uh in income taxes. Exactly. So when when I saw this chart as well, it shows like, okay, a person in the United States on Social Security, we're towards the bottom of the list, right, of, of countries that provide this this welfare. So we a, a person that retires can expect to get about 40% of the earnings that they'd been accustomed to. And and of course, if you earned way in excess of the cap, then you, you are get capped out. It's progressive. However, so by this chart, it looks like, wait a minute, why is the United States so far behind? How come we don't help our people more? Where in Denmark, Luxembourg, Portugal, Colombia, Italy, they're all up here at 70 or 80 percent of the person's income. So when, when we looked a little bit further into this, right, you could see, as you're describing, that while the United States has only a 37% roughly on average personal income rate, and they collect a 7.65 employee social security tax and then tax the employer the same amount. So we've got now uh, quite a large tax rate in my opinion, and this is something that many conservatives say we need to bring this down and liberals as well, right? We need to bring our tax rate down. So right. we still give our folks 40% of their income, right? Relatively low seeming. But when you look at the people that are on the top of that chart, let's start with Denmark, number one. Right. Wait a minute, they have a 0% social security tax rate. So they're not collecting money for this so-called trust fund that we have, and they have a very different program where they're paying their people very well, but those people are only going home with about 40% of their paycheck. So that's right, a right. very different handoff here. And I think that trend continues as you go to Luxembourg, next on the list. Now, mm -hmm. they collect almost double the Social Security that we do, as well as a higher tax rate, as well as a higher corporate tax rate. So living in Luxembourg, you may have a very high income, right? And you have to inherently for the cost of living. But that's because right, right. of these aggressive tax policies by the government. Exactly. And you're going to see this trend, in fact, even higher here in Portugal, Colombia next on the list, even higher yet again. Of course, the income tax rate's going down a bit, but these social security taxes are huge. In Italy, 40% is going towards social security. And I think that's why when you walk around the streets of Venice, you have all these old ladies sitting on their patios and they're living off of the Italian social security. You know, it's like, it's almost like yeah. a, a meme when you see it in a movie, because it's true. It's, they take their siesta and it's just a different lifestyle. They're not in that daily grind. So their equation is definitely off, right? So their spending is that definitely out of control in relation to, you know, what they can, you know, bring in infective revenue and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So that's why it behooves us, right? I, I, you know, one of our solutions, uh, at not just ours, right? This is this, the Congressional Budget Office that put this, uh, this information together. But one of the big solutions is simply a 2% increase in the FICA taxes. So when we look at that compared to the rest of these increases, that's extraordinarily modest. And that would be shared by your employer and yourself, right? So effectively, you're only having a 1% increase on uh, tax on your your income. And then we kind of have to ask ourselves as Americans, if we do follow with that particular proposal, we still need a few other solutions to get there. But with that one, 
is one percent of my paycheck you know do do you feel that that's worth it to save the entire you know social security program my personal opinion is i think that's a very modest ask you know to bring back to solvency and i think it should appeal to very conservative republicans because to us it's it's fiscal conservancy, right? We're making sure that this program remains solvent. We're, we're adhering to pris- principles of matching revenue with spending. So again, the program has, um, you know, the ability to be solvent. We just have to change the metrics a little bit. And I do want to talk about now how effective the program is, right? So we look at how much other countries spend, and it does, you know, what we spend in comparison. We we achieve quite a lot here in the U.S. So the next uh, graph that I want to move on to, it's uh, Social Security lifts 1.1 million children above the poverty line. So albeit not the most effective program, as we actually see that the uh, earned income tax credit and child tax credit lifts about 5 million children out of poverty, uh, according to the uh, 2021 statistics. But Social Security itself, for families who who need to pull on it early or disability benefits or widower benefits, things of that nature, that helps an additional 1 million children in this country. And as new, you know, I'm I'm soon to be parent and and you're a new parent yourself, you know, it it really has stressed to me how important they are as a resource for our country. And we talk about how we care about families all the time. This is one of the best programs that we could put our money quite literally where our mouth is and and show us that we care, you know? So just to be clear, though, because I don't think that retired folks are necessarily having children, we should make it clear that Social Security also helps disabled or or deceased spouses. So that's likely what this is referring to, right? A a mother who may have lost the earning husband, now they're able to have some sort of supplemental income through the Social Security program. And just that alone will help 1.1 million kids. So that is extremely important and very, very critical. If that were to go away, uh, yeah, we'd have a big problem on our hands, you know. Um, Yeah. So I don't want to I don't want to pull on any heartstrings too much, right? That, but I am a bleeding heart liberal, so I think this is like you know where we can harness the success of American capitalism and and really pay its citizens back. Otherwise, what, what's the point of having the government if if you're not getting benefits back from it? Well, right? really quick, you yeah. had mentioned that a one percent increase uh, to to the employer and a one percent increase to the employee would maybe. Uh, be enough to make up that deficit. I guess that the argument against that would be that wages have not grown with inflation or wages have not grown year over year with the cost of living. And that 1% right. is just another decrease in all of our effective pay sure. rates. So it does get a little bit scary. Um, I, I guess raising the cap may be that or maybe Joe Biden is suggesting like a gap where if you make over 160,000, that's not tax. But then once you hit 400, you go back on the tax. I'm not really sure it's fleshed out in that way. And it certainly isn't fleshed out on his website. Um, Sure. But I mean, hey, that's why you have to talk about it and understand it in a little bit of a more nuanced way. Exactly. So the plans that you're getting now from any candidate, they're just proposals. They're they're advertising, right? It's to say, this is what I believe in. Then their job is to go to Congress who actually legislates, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the the president has the veto power. But we got to remember, like... You know, the midterms are the most important thing, right? This is when we, we elect our legislators. This is Those are the people who go in, and, and as you saw last night, into the, you know, the, the 11th hour again, we're signing the budget, right? So, or, or rather the, the day before. It, and, and that was a six-month process, and it took to wait till almost midnight with a partial government shutdown. We need better legislators, right, to, to figure these things out. And again, it, it doesn't have to be only one way forward. There's a lot of different ways we can skin the cat here and, and come to this funding. It's Again, it's the wherewithal to actually want to do it. And, and, it, and it drives me crazy because as we can see, this is a very effective program. Yeah. A lot of people are counting on inaction who want the program to go away because it would immediately, you know, cut itself, right, when when the trust fund runs out. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, it is important, but it's like we've talked about week over week here in that politicians work off trading these assets of policies. That's and, exactly what's going on right, here. If you can hold this political capital to say, no, no, of course I'm not going to cut Medicaid or Medicare. And then, I mean, when you look a little bit closer at Trump's policies, they, they do uh, do that. So it doesn't exactly right. add up. Um but but yeah, I, I mean, that's the goal of, I think, this episode here is to say that this thing is important. Let's understand our options and let's talk about it. So let's finish up with these charts because I want to get more into some of the specific options. And I think there's a few, if not a little more than a few that we're going to see. Sure, sure. So then the next one would be Social Security and how it dramatically cuts poverty among the elderly and older adults. Right. So uh, there was actually a counterpoint to to this particular uh, piece of data point. 
Um, they found, uh, this was, I believe, Forbes, a contributing uh, writer to them, found that the number is probably closer to 18 to 20 percent of, of older adults who would be put in poverty uh, if the program was dramatically cut. But to me, that still says that one in five elderly and or disabled adults, widowers, etc., that we can keep out of poverty. Mm. It, it's so much more expensive to lift somebody out of poverty if we can you know, ch more cheaply prevent them from getting there. And I, I argue that the social security program is a great way to do that. And then to the next point, the next chart, uh, you know, kind of confirms that older women are making up an increasing share of these beneficiaries, right? So, uh, uh, the the expectancy of life is is higher in women, so we have you know instances of wives outliving you know their significant others, and now they don't have a means of income later in life, but they've kind of set up you know a life together and prepared financially for it. I think as a country we can you know place our values on trying to provide some social security for for you know our Americans who have paid their debt to us. Yeah, no question, and I think this chart here where it shows that that number of ninety to ninety nine individuals collecting the money. I have a feeling if you were to look at this chart from the 50s, 60s, 70s, when this program was conceived, there was probably not even a column for 90 to 99. Yeah, there was a very small, if not even noticeable cohort, right? right. So now that's the <laughs> largest cohort, and that exactly speaks to kind of what we're describing here, as this is a, um, you know, these charts are going to intersect very soon, and actually they have. We're in the negatives now, so we can't afford it anymore. Um, so what do we do? That's the question that we come to, or we find, and... That's why we turn to, and you've mentioned a few times, the Congressional Budget Office. And Mike, I cannot believe the work that you put in leading up to this episode. Um, everyone, just get ready for this. Don't be overwhelmed. It's going to be linked below as well if you wanted to just peruse it and pick your favorite option. Um, but here we go. We have something like 138 different options that come out of our Congressional Budget Office. And these all are associated with a dollar value, okay, 130 options, and this is in millions, billions of dollars in savings. So as you can see, dozens and dozens of options in discretionary spending or in mandated spending. And these are all things that the CBO has said, hey, if you want to look closer into this, here's the amount of savings you can get, right? Between 15 right. and 300 billion. If you just look into the limits of taxes on healthcare providers. There's simple, simple ways to um, skin this cat, but you gotta pick the best ones. And some of them appeal to the left and some of them appeal to the right. So right now right. as this influx and we go into this election where you might say, wow, I don't like any of my options. Well, this would be something really, really important to think about. Are we gonna cut right. or are we gonna raise our taxes or are we gonna cut our spending? Those are two very fundamentally different schools of thoughts. So. This was put out by the CBO. If you want to talk to it or point to anyone's in particular that you felt like were, hey, we should look closer at these, um, what, how would we digest this level of information? Sure. Let's jump to some of the biggest. So that's in the, the 100 series. So we're looking to get $1.15 trillion roughly to, to meet this 75-year funding uh, structure. So in the year 2033, when we run out, we're looking to then fund another 75 years because it's basically what they've worked out as so a 75-year plan. A, a lot of these proposals are either uh, a couple years old or they are just new and then they would need to take effect immediately. So the idea would be from 75 years to now, uh, and I'm not going to do that math because I'm going to make a mistake and look like an idiot, but it's uh, it's going to push us into like the 2080s, you know, uh, 2090s roughly. That's the idea is because we want to come up with a plan that solves this sh like funding shortfall for 75 years because that gives a lot of assurance to the program. And that's kind of been the benchmark whenever they do big reforms to the program is is not just fix it for a couple of years, right? Let, let, let's get a couple generational, uh, you know, uh, change to, to the program itself. So uh, specifically, we do want to hone in on those really big ones, as you can see in column B. It's 108, 109, and 110. So there's the medical hospital insurance, there's the tax rate on Social Security, and then there's taxable earnings for the Social Security payroll tax. And that's we've touched on these you know, a bit throughout the episode, but it's uh, modifying the tax rate uh, on any one of those things could almost bring total solvency to the program. Right. Yeah, so, so the idea 1. is 1.5 trillion all one of these options all of a sudden you've made up that difference. And that's if we take the most extreme, you know, version of that option, right? Is if we fully implement that option. So again, mm. the idea of the uh increase the maximal taxable earnings for that social security payroll tax, right? We don't have to go and commit to the entire measure. This is where pragmatic, compromising leaders could work with across the aisle and really negotiate, okay, 
my constituents won't tolerate this. So can I negotiate and maybe only implement half of it? So, mm-hmm. and, and this is what I actually love about the CBO. This is one of our fine institutions. And, and this is why we have to spend this kind of money to, to, to maintain a think tank like this, because it's a bunch of dedicated, hardworking men and women who do analyses throughout the year, every day, and try to give you know our Congress the best information that they could possibly have to inform their votes. I wish they read this information more because it's extremely useful. Yeah. Um, uh, and like I said, this is an extremely neutral bipartisan organization because every time they talk about any kind of tax rate, they recognize the fact that it disincentivizes productivity, right? If mm-hmm. if you're going to have higher taxes, your, uh, your cap is raised on how much you're contributing to Social Security benefits, but the benefits aren't necessarily increasing, then you're, you have less effective income. Now my, t- my free time becomes more valuable valuable. So I would want to work less, right? And this is what we kind of saw during the pandemic is a great shift of people where they just said, honestly, my time, I, you know, everything's been put into perspective, right? Like my time is so incredibly valuable. And we have to worry about that when I talk about we need to increase our GDP, right? So it's not only just spending cuts we need to figure out, we need to improve our GDP to really bring our budget back into balance. So I like that this chart also shows that there's kind of a bipartisan understanding of some of these policies. And I just took one or two. In fact, these were kind of referenced by the Trump plan. Um, So line 67 and 81, right? Reduce funding for international affairs. So as Trump put it, stop sending money to corrupt foreign countries, Um, right? But this alone would save 57 billion. So it's maybe only a tenth of what we need, but it's a good step in the door to say, okay, here's one of the 10. That's a pretty simple cut. Or like you're explaining, maybe meet in the middle. Um, the other one at number 81 is reduce the civilian employees pay, right? So I've talked about week over week how we have this growing bureaucracy, all of these folks that get paid and join the empl- employed by the government machine. Um, okay, I prefer private industry to uh, government regulation and solutions. So maybe if we find a way to reduce our headcount in the government or, or offshore or off um, offload some of this stuff into the private sector, that could be a good way to... Um, figure that out as well. Are there current people in government now that are providing solutions or are they all just kind of fighting and saying everyone else's solution is bad? You know, so, who's the best leader in this? For sure. It's very hard to say who's the best leader because again, uh, you know, people will talk about it when it's when it's good to, to, to whip up some sound bites and audio bites to throw on, you know, social media. And then seven months later, they stop talking about it, right? So that's where we're kind of running into is figuring out who the genuine people are. But there is a Republican uh, that I do want to highlight. So if we could share that video, it's actually pretty interesting. We put together a program that not only addresses the cut without raising taxes on seniors, without increasing age of eligibility for seniors, uh, put together a program which actually addressed the insolvency, but also addressed other issues as well. We had Republicans and Democrats. But we don't have a presidential candidate or a president who's willing to take it on. We would set up a fund, $1.5 trillion funding over five years. And we would allow that to be invested, no, no money from the Social Security Trust Fund, none of that. But it would be separate dollars. And we would hold that in a, an escrow account uh, and just allow a return upon the return. Whatever dividends that would return would go back into the fund. And over 70 years, it would grow. And as it grows, the, the rule of 12 towards the end is doubling, and it ends up growing enough that it takes care of 75% of the unfunded accrued liability within the Social Security program. What President Biden has proposed is increasing, uh, uh, applying payroll taxes to everybody making over $400,000. Now, the only problem with that, he's proposed it for multiple other programs already. Yeah. Uh, to a tune of about $4.5 trillion. And now he wants to add an additional amount on top of that $4.5 trillion he's already applied it to. So as you can see, the senator is offering alternative solutions that are available to us. Um, you know, So even if we look outside the, the CBO you know, report of all the options that we have, there's even more still available out there if we want to creatively problem solve. And I can't keep harping on this enough. It's really just a matter of political will and not ability. So, Mike, I can't help that in two weeks in a row now, you've brought us two Republican congresspeople, Thomas Massey, and now this gentleman from Louisiana. So I think there's hope yet. But um, (laughs) yeah, 
No, it. I mean, hey, it's another good idea, right? So all of these different options are in play, um, and it's really about finding the one that makes the most sense um, or makes the most political sense for that candidate. And that's kind of not the best theory, but hey, right, that's right. maybe where we are at with our system <laughs> yep. of our, our federal system. Um, and a fun little yeah. fact about Social Security is that the first recipient, her name was Ida May Fuller. She received $22.54 in the year 1940. That was the first check that was issued. Yeah, that's when a Ford motor car, car cost like $35, so maybe it made sense. Yeah, right? Your, your annual but, income was like $1,000 back then. That's crazy, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, so what if we're if that average American is collecting 40% of their income, I think that though, like what people should expect at their in their old age is something like what between 20 and $30,000 a year. Is that really what it is? I yeah. think it amounts to something like 1700 and change a month. So yeah, roughly $20,000 a year you're going to see, you know, as benefits, you know, so yeah, these are which, incredibly expensive no. programs. Um, that's and, below the poverty line if that's your only income. Absolutely. So again, there, there's more resiliency in our retiring communities than there was in previous generations, but it's an important leg of the stool. We've all been paying into it. So don't you dare let the federal government not give you some of your taxes back. That's the way I see it. Um, mm -hmm. And then when we put together budget and, and, and policy priorities, you know, we have to say, what do we what do we want to spend as Americans? And I think, you know, there's some ideas that we share that there's spending that we could cut, right? So there's there's things that we can do to bring our budget back into, you know, resolution, but even simpler is fixing this, the solvency for Social Security itself, you know? Yeah, well, talking about like voting to ensure that you get these entitlements, right? Because again, you mean we've been working in the workforce for over a decade, we've been paying into this uh, thousands of years every, or thousands of dollars every year. So another aspect of not letting this be taken away from us is regarding raising the retirement age. Let's say if that if you're a 63 year old voter or 62 year old voter, and you now have three to five to seven years before you're exiting the workforce and collecting your full entitlement, um, that talk of raising the retirement age may actually be quite threatening or quite ominous. Um, so as Ben Shapiro makes it kind of lighthearted and that, what are you going to sit at home? Just keep working. You know, that's not probably the reality for people that maybe work with their hands or have backbreaking labor all day and really need Absolutely. to ultimately stop. Um, so I think I actually appreciate a little bit what Nikki Haley said in that, Let's leave all of the folks who are about to retire and as their retirement age, but then by birth year, what we can do is folks that are like 20 years or younger and haven't hit that workforce yet or haven't been paying nearly as much into this program, right. perhaps we can then progressively increase their tax uh, or their retirement age because their life expectancy will be so much greater in 60 to 70 years. Th this will run into the same problem in that time. So maybe you don't love that right if you're a 20 year old new voter and you wouldn't choose that uh unfortunately you don't represent the majority of this country so you may not get a say on that um and it's likely that we will experience that someone who's 20 right now or 10 or our kids right now who are not even one those kids are going to probably say it'll be normal to them to live to 150 years old and yeah, would you right. really retire at 60 in that case? Maybe, maybe not, right? Hey, I'd love to retire at 40. So we have to find a way that works for the population. And remember that so, so, so many people rely on this. Um, and it just helps a lot of people. So I hope we were able to learn something good today. Um, Item who made $22 and many of these folks who live in the middle of the country who are now making 2200 every month. Um, it, it, it's important money that they rely on. And this next president that we choose is going to be crucial in determining what happens going forward with this program, whether or not they plenarily take it away or they reform it, increase our taxes or change your expectation of what you can see when you're working in this workforce for an extra decade or more potentially, um, which could be a really, really negative factor for a lot of people. So Mike, right. with, with that, give me your closing thoughts. What, what would you choose if you were the one to go into power? How would you make this work? Sure. Uh, I'd love to, you know, have a pipe dream that there's somehow we could thread the needle and just take a little bit from each of those options. But I think the biggest ones are talking a little bit about age, right? Raising the age a little bit. It helps. It buys time for the program. It pushes solvency out a few years. I definitely believe in a FICA tax. Um, I think that a 1%, while, you know, onerous, is a very small ask to preserve the solvency of the program. And I and agree then with even you on so, that. 
even so with me, right, is our generation is like, uh, uh, you know, to guarantee its solvency and, and not affect the payout benefits in any way for a generation as far back as mine. I think it's such a small cost to really pay. I think that there's certainly things in spending that we could look at, right? Whether it be foreign spending, allocations to the literally dozens of programs that we saw in the CBO sheet. You know, there's a little room in there, but I think what we can get off of right off the bat and just Americans having the honest conversation and being, you know, do we want to be fiscally responsible? And if so, that means just a very modest tax along with a few other proposals that people have to compromise on. I think we can get there taking a little bit incrementally from each of these options probably would be the best option. Um, but I would say that, in, in my opinion, um, raising the tax doesn't need to happen. I think that we can find ways to cut the budget in other places and specifically reallocate that money to rebuild that trust fund, which has historically been reliable. Um, it really came down to the unemployment. And hey, Mr. Biden, right, your unemployment rate is something that you're most proud of. So all of a sudden, this should be increasing the amount of money that we're taking in. And that number is increasing, right. um, but the number going out is increasing even faster. So right. if we can figure right. out a way, let's say, instead of sending $200 billion to Ukraine in the last four years, maybe we could have sent $100 billion, and then $100 billion could have gone to give us a surplus in that trust fund, right? I could say the same about the wall. I could say the same about a well, lot of things. Um, I was just going to say, yeah, I mean, we, we, we got to look at you know, historically, we've missed a lot of opportunities in these countries, right? So it kind of ties into this growing wealth inequality that has, has created a problem in this system and stuff. So it's it's people like you and I and, and people in lower socioeconomic brackets who are fighting harder and harder to make proportionally less and less over a year. And, and we have to look at like, you know, things like the war on terror has costed us, you know, $200 billion up front and probably the estimates of about a trillion dollars all around. And it's like, well, there's almost the entire shortfall funding for Social Security, right? So when we engage in these kind of conflicts, we have to realize that money doesn't come from nowhere and that we're subsidizing current problems with future proceeds, right? So yeah. as you know, year goes on, deficits increase and we're spending more and more just to service these debts and we're ignoring these important programs that really improve the lives of Americans over many generations or rather decades. It's going to have a significant impact on these generations. Yeah. So guys, take note. We hope you learned something today. If you like this episode, give us that thumbs up and please subscribe to the channel. Uh, we're available on YouTube and Spotify. Please follow us on Substack, elevatedthoughts.substack.com, um, as well as X and Instagram. You can find the link in the bio. So thank you again. We put all of the resources that we referenced down here. Um, so please, if you have any questions, we'll answer you in the comments below um, and we'll see you next week. Thank you, Mike. Looking forward to it. Take care, Coop. Right.